In 2017, I travelled to a European capital to meet a source, a senior official in the intelligence service of an EU and NATO member. At the time, elections were looming in Germany. The far-right AFD party was doing well in the polls. It was part of a wider pattern. Across Europe and beyond, new political forces were disrupting the status quo. Some were raising questions about links to Russia. My source told me he had evidence that suggested that a prominent AFD candidate in the upcoming election to the Bundestag, the German parliament, was cultivating ties to Moscow. The politician's name was Marcus Fronmeier, and my source said he had a document to support his claim. The document is basically a request for help for support in the candidate's election campaign, and it appears to be addressed to individuals in Russia. If elected, the letter promises, the candidate will maneuver himself into an influential position and be sympathetic to policies favored by the Kremlin. Mr. Fronmeier was head of the AFD's youth wing, and he'd been pretty open about his pro-Russian views on subjects like EU sanctions against Russia, the annexation of Crimea, and the war in eastern Ukraine. Here's a picture of him in Crimea in 2016, attending the Yalta Economic Forum, a gathering for Kremlin-friendly politicians and journalists. One of those journalists was Manuel Oxenreiter. Here he is, a year later, at the same forum in Crimea. My source described him as the middleman, a facilitator of contacts between the AFD and the Kremlin. The man on the Russian end, I was told, was Sargis Mirzakhanyan, pictured here on the right, and again here with Mr. Fronmeier. So, in 2017, a week before the election, I travelled to Berlin. At this stage, I still hadn't actually seen the document that my source talked about. I met Mr. Oxenreiter, who seemed excited by the prospect of AFD members in the Bundestag. We will hear in the federal parliament new voices criticizing the US American influence, as well as the influence, for example, of the Brussels policy. I would call that um, a sovereignist point of view, a German sovereignist. Um, independent point of view. Some might also call that the Russian point of view. Speaking. Are you a, an agent of Russian No, influence? of course not. Of course not. I'm an agent of German interest. So we are connecting. And, and that's what people um, fear, I think, about you, is mm -hmm. that you're, you're somebody who, who connects people in Russia, who maybe are connected mm -hmm. to the Kremlin, with politicians in Germany, uh, who may soon be in the Bundestag, and mm -hmm. thereby creating these channels of influence from Russia into mm -hmm. Germany. So what is the question? I, <laughs> is that the case? Is that what you're doing? I'm connecting people, yes, and there is nothing dangerous about this, there is nothing bad about this. The following day, my source sent me a copy of the document itself. It's entitled Fronmeier, Election Campaign, action plan, brackets, draft. It's written in occasionally faulty English. What it apparently shows is someone writing on behalf of Mr. Fulmeyer's campaign. For the election campaign, we urgently would need some support, the letter states, and it goes on. Besides material support, we would need media support as well. Any type of interviews, reports, and opportunities to appear in the Russian media is helpful for us, it says. During the campaign, the document promised, Mr. Fronmeier would focus on topics including good relations with the Russian Federation, sanctions, EU interference in Russian domestic politics. And if elected, Mr. Fronmeier would immediately start operating in the foreign policy field. That afternoon, I went to see Mr. Fronmeier in his hometown, a picturesque little place on the edges of the Black Forest. Tell me about it, your town. Actually, that's my hometown. Yeah. The name of the town is Weilerstadt. Yeah. It's not a long time ago that I was in school. <laughs> I'm young. Yeah. And, um, Over coffee at a local cafe, Mr. Fronmeier told me his Kremlin-friendly policies, 
His opposition to EU sanctions were motivated only by a desire to see Germany do well. We have to think what is good for Germany, what is good for our country. And um, if I ask this question to myself, I would say for us it's good to have good relations to Russia and also to America. He told me he'd never taken any Russian money, apart from expenses for his trips to Crimea and Donbass. I've got this, this, um, this document here. This is your election campaign action plan. And it says here, um, you know, for the election campaign, we urgently would need some support. Um, besides material support, we'd need media support as well to put Frau Meyer, um in the poll position for foreign politics in the future party fraction. Now, so, so what, what did you I, mean by that? I never saw this document. It says here that you... you what, what would that mean to you, besides material support? What, what, what does material support imply? You have to ask the guy who wrote this document. Yeah. It's not my document. Are you sure? You've never seen this document before? No. I think that's a fake document, yes. As we continued, our conversation became increasingly uncomfortable. The document's metadata suggested it was written by Manuel Oxenwright, the journalist we met earlier. So I called him up. Hello, Manuel. Yes, hello. hello. It's, it's Gabriel Gatehouse here from the BBC. I was told that, that you drafted this document. You, you didn't. You, you, you say this is not true. Yeah. Also, ich würde, ich würde, ich würde, ich würde das Interview dann jetzt abbrechen. Ich finde es nämlich ziemlich albern, was wir hier gerade machen. Entschuldigung, dass du da angerufen wirst, Manuel. Ja, ja, ja. Okay, my friend, I'm sorry, I want to stop this interview because that's not the kind I'm, I'm used to doing interviews. The document looked plausible enough, but journalistically there were problems with it. The metadata that indicated that Oxenwriter was the author was pretty basic. It wasn't enough to go on. We didn't have the email that it was attached to, so we didn't know who'd sent it or whether anyone in a position of power in Russia had received it, let alone acted on it. So in the end, back in 2017, we just decided not to run the story. In the meantime, Marcus Frohnmeyer was indeed elected to the Bundestag. The election was an earthquake. It was the first time since the end of the Nazi era that an overtly nationalist far-right party had won seats in Germany's national parliament. Frohnmeyer hired Ochsenreiter as his parliamentary advisor, and he continued promoting a line of political thinking that was close to that of the Kremlin. My impression is that Frohnmeyer has pretty much fulfilled the expectations of the people who in Russia who were supporting him because ever since he entered the Bundestag, he continuously um, went on against the sanctions uh, against Russia. So basically, he has been the perfect spokesman for Russian interests in Germany. But politically, I have the impression that he's going down the same road that he went down before entering the Bundestag. I think that the, the great advantage that Frohnmeyer presents to the Russians is that he actually believes their message. Fast forward to this year. I'm working on different stories. I get a call from a contact who works for the exiled former Russian oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky, an opponent of Vladimir Putin. He funds an organization called the Dossier Center, which aims to investigate and expose Kremlin attempts to influence Western politicians. The Dossier Center agreed to share some of its documents with Newsnight as well as with journalists from the German TV channel ZDF, the magazine Der Spiegel, and the Italian newspaper La Repubblica. We worked together with the German journalists on this investigation. These documents are completely separate from the one that I was given in 2017. The main paper looks like a sort of strategy document. It's written in Russian and most of it outlines quite general efforts to influence public opinion and decision makers across the EU on topics such as Crimea and sanctions. But right at the end here, there's something more specific. Under the heading elections to the Bundestag, the document names one candidate, Marcus Frohnmeyer. It continues, chance of passing into the Bundestag, high. 
required support in the election campaign. And then there's this extraordinary assessment. Result, we will have our own absolutely controlled MP in the Bundestag. This document is attached to an email. And because we have the actual email itself, we have a lot more information about who sent it and who was on the receiving end. The email reads, Dear Sergei Alexandrovich, that's Sergei Sokolov, a senior official in Vladimir Putin's presidential administration. It continues, I am sending you information for possible use in your work to report to Alexander Leonidovich, that's Sokolov's boss, Alexander Manjosin, the director of foreign policy in the Kremlin. It goes on. Kirpichov, Alexander Olegovich, can provide details of the project. Alexander Kirpichov is a young graduate of the Russian Foreign Ministry's Diplomatic Academy. A picture from 2016 shows him in Yalta, standing next to Zargis Mirzakhanyan, who my source described as Mr. Frohnmeyer's Russian contact, and, in the middle, Marcus Frohnmeyer himself. The email is signed, yours, Premyak Pyotr Grigorievich. Pyotr Premyak is a former naval counterintelligence officer and a former member of the upper house of the Russian parliament. A journalist from ZDF approached Mr. Premyak last month in Moscow for comment. He didn't want to be filmed, but he did confirm no. that he was the sender of no. the email. The date of the email is worth noting, 3rd of April 2017. The attached document says a detailed campaign program will be received at the end of next week. And the date of my original document, entitled Fronmeyer Election Campaign Action Plan Draft, is 11th of April, i.e. the following week. We don't have direct proof that the second document was the result of the first, but the two documents appear to fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We contacted Mr. Frohnmeyer again this week. He repeated that he knew nothing about any of the documents and said he had not requested nor received any financial support. He said he couldn't explain why the author of the Russian document would describe him as an absolutely controlled MP. He said he'd never been controlled by any third party. So what does it all add up to? Well, on the one hand, we see what appears to be a request on behalf of the campaign of a prospective German MP for help from the Russians. On the other hand, we see what appears to be an enthusiastic assessment of this politician's potential value to the Russian state addressed to senior officials in the Kremlin. What we don't see is any evidence that the Kremlin then acted on that request or indeed that the MP received any Russian support. Moscow's interest in Marcus Frohnmeyer fits a wider pattern. Other documents obtained by the Dossier Center and seen by Newsnight show an official at the Russian embassy in Berlin developing the relationship as early as 2014. It fits in exactly the kind of pattern that we've seen on the whole. There is often this easy assumption that, that Putin is the grand mastermind who is behind everything in, in a way that all orders cascade down from above. In fact, the way the Russian system works is, is quite the opposite. So you have a whole variety of different political entrepreneurs, in effect. People who think they've got a bright idea, they've got a particular contact, they spot a particular opportunity, and they pitch the idea. It's basically being pitched from below. People are saying, look, here's my bright idea, what do you think? So something like this is absolutely, it's people who are thinking, this could, be, this could be good, and if I do this, and if this is successful, and if therefore precisely the, the Kremlin does get a, a deputy absolutely under its control, I will be rewarded by whatever coin is more appropriate. This is what we face at the moment, an incredibly diffuse, grassroots upward campaign of various kinds of active measures. The case of Marcus Frohnmeyer appears to be a snapshot of a much wider phenomenon, of Moscow supporting and nurturing, and in some cases financing, political figures and movements in Europe and beyond. Parties that were once on the fringes that are now moving towards the mainstream. AFD in Germany, Le Pen in France, others in Austria, Italy, 
even the United Kingdom. Many of these influence operations come to nothing, but a few succeed, forming a loosely connected but growing network inside Europe, sympathetic to the political aims of Moscow. Well, Gabriel Gatehouse is here now. So how have the Ru Russians responded to your film? Well, the Russians uh, sent us a statement saying, we don't see it as, this is the um, Russian embassy in Berlin, we don't see it as problematic if our employees at work maintain contacts with various political forces and social structures uh, of the state of residence in Germany. Uh, but they said, as for financing political activities in the Federal Republic of Germany, in particular donations, of course, that's out of the question. And they say that, of course, because it would be illegal. So also you were talking there about you know, the, the wider spread of this. What is the big picture? Well, look, the Russians have an absolutely equal opportunities uh, attitude and policy towards all this. They don't just focus on the far right. They support and nurture parties on the left, uh, separatist parties, independence movement. RT and Sputnik loved the Scottish Indy referendum. Uh, they loved Catalonia, even though Russia isn't terribly keen on these kinds of movements in their own country. Um, and they pick people who are already sympathetic to their cause. So there's often this idea that amongst certain people that Russia's climbed in the brains of the Western electorate. They've made Trump and Brexit happen. They try to, but of course, what they're really doing is exploiting divisions that are already existing in Western society. So if you think that Trump and Brexit only happened because of the Russians, you're barking up the wrong tree. Gabriel, thanks very much indeed.